I'm going to share something with y'all. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife and saying, completely different ball game. I'll walk away from it and this has been like a therapy session. For yourself and kind of the journey you've been on to get here, are there ever moments where you kind of just pinch yourself? I mean, even if you look at the last six months, the fact that you've been around Floyd, been involved in a fight with Floyd, and there's been cameras, there's been lights. I mean, I've known you for a while, but I've seen your face more than I have in kind of a media sense. Do you ever just kind of sit back and perhaps go, wow, or do you have to pinch yourself at times, kind of the journey you've come on to, to get here? You know what? I don't really have time to reflect, to tell you the truth, because I'm always in a gym every single day. And I think, yeah, the times when I probably do reflect is straight after fights, you know, and I'm like, wow. It's like in the change room, like immediately? N um, no. When I get home and I watch the fights back and I'm like, wow, you know, you know, we're, we're really doing something special, you know. So um, that's the times when I reflect and um, obviously there's a bigger, obviously I'm passionate about boxing, but I'll, alongside that I've got my family to look after as well so you know I always want to be the best that I can be every day for, for them obviously I know you told me you grew up in the care system um, so when you've had a start in life that is perhaps more difficult than others is it ever something you kind of believed as a kid because yeah we all have beliefs sometimes you have delusional beliefs I believed I was going to be a professional footballer at one point um, but is it ever something that you kind of fully believed that yeah I can kind of get out of this and I would say make something of myself yeah, and don't get me wrong, because I'm such a perfectionist, I do still have doubts that, you know, things will work out how I want them. But that's only because I'm a perfect perfectionist and I want everything. Uh, I demand a lot of myself and, and that's because of what I've been through. You know, when you get put into foster homes at two years of age and I stayed, I think, around about with, around about with 14 different families, and I don't think people understand how that affects the mind of um, obviously uh, a child growing up, especially in those vital years where you need, you know, uh, you know, a mother and a father for, for guidance and, and stuff like that. Um, and this stuff is still new to me, you know, because, you know, you know, when it comes to me, my background of foster homes and my mental health and stuff, um, it's sometimes i find it hard to talk about but then another side of me is like you know what i've got to come out of my comfort zone because there's people that look up to me and there might be people in a similar situation that want advice or want to hear my story so when i've been in 14 different foster homes that's really affected me growing up and it goes into your adult life people don't understand that you it get you get affected as a child but it's like subconsciously affecting you it you doesn't really come into play until your adult life and i suffered from abuse in foster homes you know i obviously i had some foster homes that were wonderful and good to me but there was foster homes that i suffered a lot of uh, mental and physical abuse i lived on my own from a young age from like 17 years of age so i've had to learn to stay on my own two feet um and do things myself and that's why I'm very stubborn as well when it comes to my career because I had to do things a lot a lot of the things on my own and had to suffer a lot on my own when it comes to my career that's one thing I don't let anyone destroy that you know so my world is boxing I might be a bit reserved outside of the gym but when I'm in the gym I come alive and, and that's the world that I created for myself I know where I'm going I know what I want and I'm, I'm going to do everything possible to get there. See, looking from an outside perspective as someone, and many people, I guess, might think this, of someone who hasn't experienced that, when you talk about kind of direct trauma, you would think perhaps it hardens you up. So like you said, maybe it's more subconscious when you're a child, but you'd think it hardens you up. But whether it hardens you up or not, you're basically saying them scars will always remain. It doesn't matter what you do, what you achieve, them scars will always remain, albeit 20, 30 years in the past. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm 37 now and I still deal with a lot of, you know, I still have a lot of issues, you know, behind closed doors that I have to deal with on a daily basis, you know. Um, and also I've got a condition, I suffer with borderline personality disorder and that stems from childhood trauma. So it affects your emotions and how you think, how you feel. 
and you've got to learn to manage your your triggers um, um, so you can stabilize your emotions so I've got a lot of things um, to deal with on a daily basis but as I said you know I'm built like like steel because of the things that I've been through so I know how to put on a poker face and at the same time I know how to get through difficult moments and that's why all the difficult moments I've had in boxing as well I've, I'm, I'm still standing and I'm still got that end goal in mind no matter what happens you know um, yeah and I'm, I'm very hard on myself I remember my fighter saying after a training session go uh, you know you could smile more, be happy more. And I said, I'll be happy when you become a world champion, you know? And, and that's, that's my mentality, you know, because I, I work so hard. And although I'm getting a lot of success at the moment, this is not where it ends for me, you know? My, where it ends for me is, and the new WBC, whatever weight of one of my fighters wins or all of them win world championships, you know, whatever world title, that's when you'll probably see me cry my eyes out in the ring when that happens. Could I kind of get you to open up a bit more about the borderline personality disorder for people who aren't too familiar with it? It's something obviously that I've heard about, but I don't myself know too much about. Um, kind of how that affects perhaps, is it like decisions you make? Are you perhaps a bit more irrational? And has it been something that has got easier growing up, I guess, or perhaps more difficult? Because I suppose as a child, life is a bit more stress-free. You don't have your bills, your family, your work life, etc. So just kind of about how it's differed growing up, easier, more difficult, and kind of what sort of things it's entailed that for you? Yeah, um, it does get easier as you um, grow up. It's a long life, uh, a long life condition, so it doesn't go away. Um, there's no cure for it. It's just about managing your emotions, but a lot of it comes from childhood trauma. So when you've, when, I've been moved around a lot. So imagine as a kid, I always think to myself this, imagine, I sometimes think to myself, imagine what, let's say, a four-year-old child must be thinking at that moment where they're getting comfortable with one foster home and then social services come and take you and take you to a complete new home of strangers. And I remember some of the times where I'd be anxious and I'll be in the car, I'll be looking around at my surroundings, like, where am I going, where am I going? And then I get in that house, and then it's a new family, and you're shy, you don't even want to go to the toilet, you don't want to ask for a drink, all these things. These are the little things that affect you growing up. So when it comes to, like, you know, uh, like um, my wife, you know, and my kids, they've suffered because, obviously... I don't know, it's like it affects your emotions in a way like you always think people are going to leave you, you know what I mean? Or you don't think people are genuine towards you. Or, Does it make you struggle with stability then? Yeah, 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 stability is a, is a big one. So if anything enters your mind like that person don't love you or whatever or don't care about you, it can make you just go off, you know, and, and, and you know, look for attention elsewhere and, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, and it could be something small, like let's say I've got me i'm a big trainer sneaker lover and i don't need new trainers but i could walk past a shop and if i get that impulsive thought in my head i'll go straight in there and spend money that i don't need to spend you know or binge binge eating you know impulsive you know that's one of the biggest ones in the condition like you're very impulsive so you've got to control that and you've got to have a support system, a family around you that understands the condition. Because if they don't, then it will affect them. And they'll be thinking, oh, one minute you were so loving, and the next minute you're so cold, you know, and now it's affecting them. But if they understand, no, it's not them. Like, for example, I could have, uh, I could be sitting in the same room as you, and I don't want to talk, but I want you there. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? So it's a weird one, man, but it's, you know, getting, imagine getting pushed around your whole life. You kind of get used to that. So you always want a new environment all the time. You know, even if it's not for the best, you're always looking for a new environment. So as I've got older, I've had to learn to like, you know, manage those kind of things and be like, you know, I'm happy where I am. Look what I have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and obviously boxing, <clears throat> pardon me, boxing is a sport where you have to make, I guess, impulsive decisions, but 
you kind of can't rely on impulsive decisions as well. Um, that, that is really interesting. I kind of want to take it to a point where it talks about your boxing journey from when you started to now, because obviously, like I said, things have kind of got bigger. They're on a bigger scale than they were, say, five, ten years ago. Um, was you nervous about things kind of stepping up? Was you nervous about even things like taking on Kenny, the thought of the Floyd Mayweather fight? Was you kind of nervous about all of that and nervous about the pressures and kind of the the things that would come with it? Yeah. Um, I suppose I, it's, easy, it's easy to be low-key in, in a way. Yeah. Uh, it, it was, but the thing is, I'm weird like that. I love when, you know, all the pressure is on. I love it when it's like that. And maybe that, again, stems from my, my childhood where I had to, you know, rely on myself a lot of the time. And when you rely on yourself, you know, I can't turn around and point fingers and go, oh, well, this happened because of you and this and that. It's all on me. That's the kind of pressure I like. So, for example, uh, with, with my pro fighters, even though they've been with me from the beginning of their pro careers, They've already had an amateur background, so I've got a foundation and a base to work with to mold them into how I want. Um, but with Kenny starting from scratch, yeah, it was like, as I said, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And, uh, and then sometimes I question myself as a coach, you know, can I get him to where I w want him, you know? Um, and then the Deji one was even a tougher one um, assignment because he come with me already losing a lot of fights and everyone saying he's no good, he's rubbish, this and that. His management reached out, out to me asking me to train him and at first I hesitated. I was like, oh, I don't know, my brother's enough, you know. I don't know if I want to do another YouTuber, but I thought it'd be good for my brother to have someone in the same field, in the same stable, you know, where they can bounce off each other. But with him, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be hard work. And I remember at the O2 Arena, before that fight, it was make or break. If he lost that fight, I would have got crucified by his fan base. So I was saying to myself, you know, it's going to be like at mid the stroke of midnight. You know when Cinderella and everything goes back to reality? That's what I told everyone. I said, at the stroke of midnight, I'm either going to get crucified by all of Deji's fans and even though I'm a professional boxing coach and I've got my pros and I've got my field there the influencer world don't care about that yeah at the end of the day they're going to see it as I made Deji lose yeah I'm the one that's made Deji look like that so I was like oh it's all going to come crashing down but obviously that's, that's what I'm talking about I like that kind of pressure you know and that's what makes us perform and, and train how we train I'm the kind of coach that I want my fighter to have some kind of responsibility. Um, and then the other half is obviously me giving them all the tools to go out there and do a job, game plan, analyzing, you know, um, breaking down the small details of uh, boxing and not just drills, but actually talking to them and showing them things and showing them things that ha can happen in a fight. Because that's another thing. I what are fighters going in there to do? They're going in there to fight, you know? So show them fight situations, throw them, show them fight scenarios, make them watch, you know? There might be something I'm telling them, but they're not quite getting it just from me just telling them. So I need to be able to have the ability to um, get that information across in a different way. How do I get that information across? Yes, I'm gonna show them, but also, what I'm showing them, I want them to actually see it being done in a real fight. So I'll whip out, whip out my phone in the middle of the session and we will go over. Look, you see what I'm talking about now? This is what I want you to do. And they're like, oh, okay, now I get it. And then, then we we'll go over it. Repetition, repetition, until they get it and they understand it. And then they can apply it in sparring. When you apply it in sparring, and then you get confident. And when you're confident, you'll be able to do it in a real fight. So it's about half and half. I want to see the dedication and the responsibility of my fighter. Um, and then obviously, I know what I want when it comes to boxing. Uh, I'm passionate, I'm, I'm dedicated with my craft in the small details. So when you put those two together, we should be able to get to where we want to get to. Yeah, such an interesting kind of thing to pick a trainer's brain about the role of a trainer. Because, all right, like I said, it's 
the trainer and the fighter, but there's so much more kind of than just the dynamic of one telling the other what to do and them doing it. Um, obviously, you were a professional boxer as well. Um, did you find it easier or more difficult being a professional boxer than you have a trainer? Because, like you said, because you had to stand on your own two feet as a kid, I can imagine that standing in the ring and kind of being in that position that you were as a fighter that was kind of something you, you relished. Yeah, because it was similar, you know? The only difference is you've got loads of people watching you. So you get that adrenaline rush and everything. Is that adrenaline rush ever matchable? Just quickly, because I know most fighters, regardless what they do after, will just say no. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, even, even as a coach, you know, when Deji won at the O2 Arena, my brother won at the O2 Arena, you know, even, even my pros, when they win, we put so much into it that I start, yeah, all my emotions come out, you know, when they win, you know. So um, I'm calm, but they all come out after the fight. But um, I think it's easier. I think it's easier for me. It was easier for me as a, as, as a fighter. I know this is going to sound weird, right? And I know a lot you can get hurt in boxing, but because of the way my life was as a kid, I didn't care about the consequences of when I stepped in the ring. Obviously, I will avoid those consequences and the way I see boxing is hit and not get hit. That's my style of fighting and my style of coaching. But there was, no, I, yeah, I had fear. I had fear, everyone has fear. Otherwise you wouldn't be human. But I didn't care about the consequences because I'm like, what I've been through in my life is nothing compared to what I'm facing in the ring. So I was prepared to, if something bad was to happen, I'm prepared to go through it and it is what it is. So I think it was um, easier for me as a fighter, uh, as a coach. The reason why it's harder, because I've got my fighters' life in their hands and um, I'm a perfectionist. I, don't, I know the dangers in boxing. I don't want to see my fighters hurt. I need to protect them. And how I protect them is not only while they're fighting, but way before the fight, by doing the right training, discipline training, and, and ed the right education, so they can look after themselves in there and go in there and, and do the business. Yeah, Daly, I want to move on to something that I know you're passionate about, um, and that's the mental health side of things. Obviously, we don't need to go through kind of the last couple of years and how it's something that is kind of more accepted, especially in men. Um, it's always been a big thing in boxing. Um, but I know that the British board have now got things in place as well, which is something that obviously you're delighted with. And um, again, I suppose from someone who was a fighter and is now a trainer, from both sides, it would be interesting to kind of get your take on uh, how much of perhaps a pandemic it actually is in the sport. Yeah, it's uh, vital in the sport. And I'm glad the British Boxing Board of Control, actually, I was surprised because when every three years you have to renew your, your, your first aid and they've actually put it within the first aid course, like, where everyone can sit and discuss about mental health. So I think that's a big step forward. Obviously, there's still more work that needs to be done. And especially with men, men are like, you know, I'm not saying women don't find it hard to talk and all that kind of stuff, but a lot of women talk to other women and they're open to the, with one another. Even when it comes to anything in life, it doesn't have to be about mental health. They're just more open than men. Um, but men don't really go to another man and go, you know, bro, I've got this problem. I don't know what to do. I need help and this and that. They don't just, they don't do that. So I'm nervous and, you know, of talking about this on camera, but I also know it's bigger than just me. You know, there's a lot of men out there that suffer with mental health and um, there needs to be, you know, people with a voice to talk about it and say, you know, there is help out there. Or even if you don't want to go to a doctor, you know, turn to your, your, your guy friends and, you know, have a discussion. Have you encountered it many times in professionals you've worked with? I know this is, it could be a bit of a strange question because, you know, you're not going to directly name names or anything, but have you encountered it with fighters you've worked with and <clears throat> perhaps seen the damage that it's done to fighters? Yeah, and um, we're not afraid to say it. I've, um, I've, I've, you know, I've seen it with with one of my fighters now. Um, now, that, like in the past, uh, me and Martin Foru, we have a very 
open and close relationship because we've both been through similar stuff in our lives. And, um, you know, we're, we're all human and you can't deal with everything and just you're not made of stone and don't have no emotion. Um, but with me and Martin's relationship, he, I always know, I, he doesn't have to tell me anything for me to know that there's something wrong. So that, that's what I think with men, especially with men as well, is about, you know, understanding each other, you know? So sometimes you don't have to always speak, but you, you know something's up and you, something's, something's wrong. But yeah, I've, I've had it with uh, Martin where, you know, he hasn't felt, you know, right. And then I'll be like, and when something like that happens, I'm like, we don't need to train today. Forget training, forget boxing, you know. Boxing ain't bigger than this, you know. And actually, there was a time where I came in the gym. Martin goes, coach, what's wrong? Tear came down my eye, which I never, ever do. But it's the way he said it to me that made the tear come down. And Martin goes, coach, you don't have to train me today. Let's just go. Let's just get out of here and go for a coffee. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, me and Martin have a close relationship like that. So, um, yeah, what can I say, man? Do you think it could be difficult in this day and age as well in the sense that I feel like there's kind of just a relentless, not just in boxing, this just could be in many different avenues, but especially in sport in general, it's kind of the relentless pursuit of success. It's like you train every second of every day and if you cut a single corner, then you're, you're a punk. You've got to do every single thing to the letter, bang, bang, bang. Um, whereas... You know, without trying to get too deep, we're on this earth for what 78 years. Sometimes it's perhaps just about sitting back and just going, Thank God I'm here and, and, and just chilling rather than it being constant bang, 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 bang all the time. Yeah, and that's why we, we with my stable, we've got a nice balance between, yes, we know what kind of sport we're in. It's a selfish sport. We all know that. It's a selfish sport and it's a dangerous sport. So obviously, we apply ourselves with pro professionalism. And, and we don't cut corners. But at the same time, it's a very uh, isolated sport, you know, where if things are not going your way or if you're not getting the right type of fights or if you're not fighting enough or you're finding it hard to sell tickets and all that kind of stuff, and then your fighters can get depressed. So in my stable, we've got that balance between, you know what, well, we can have a laugh and we can joke around as long as we're training hard. We can laugh, we can joke, we can talk about things outside of... I'm not one of these coaches are like where um, they come in the gym, it's like, I'm your coach and nothing else and you can't talk to me about anything else in your life. It's strictly business. I do not... I've heard people that say you shouldn't get close to a fighter, but I do not not believe in that because if you don't get close to a fighter in that way and understand your fighter that way, understand them as a human being, their personality, you know, and then how are you going to know when they're up? How are you going to know when they're down? How are you going to get the best out of them of a fighter if you don't understand them as a human being? I think that's the first thing as a coach you should be doing is understanding them as a human being and, and, and their personality, the emotions, you know, every fight is, this, is different. They've all got different personalities. Some you might need to be a bit tougher on, some you need to put an arm around their shoulder, you know, so some you might be more of a comedian with, you know, so you, it's about understanding the fighter. Yeah, really interesting uh, thing to pick your brains on again. Um, I want to take it now to the Mayweather things. I just think that is the most interesting thing to talk about, especially from my perspective, because I kind of, I mean, I'm 24. I grew up in an era where I look at that. And I mean, I saw him at the open workout the other day and I was starstruck. I look at that as a reason I got into boxing. So just kind of even any little secrets you can give us around that week. Um, what's it like being kind of, kind of even in the aura of the man? Um, yeah, I just thought I'd end it talking about Floyd because it just must have been so, so good. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, even from the, uh, the first press conference, the tour that we done was in Vegas in, in, at, the, at his gym. So even from there, it's just, yeah, the aura that he brings, you know, it's, it's just crazy. But one thing... There's not many fighters I like to like really listen to in detail. So when he speaks, he's one of those fighters. Mike Tyson is another one. Lennox Lewis is another one. And Bernard Hopkins is another one. Um, but when he talks, I use it. So for example, when I was in Vegas in the gym, 
even after the press conference was finished, I s stayed in that gym for a little bit longer just to surround myself um, with how it is in the Mayweather gym, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of good fighters there and I wanted to feel and smell the culture, you know, and understand what they do in that gym. So they're the things that I take, you know. So yes, it's Floyd Mayweather. I love Floyd Mayweather. But um, w when I'm listening to him or, you know, because I was involved in this event, I take away the like the little things, you know, like the business side of things of him or the way he goes about things, like little things he does, the way he speaks to the media, all these kind of things to help teach, not only teach myself, but also give knowledge to my fighters. And I'll be like, look, this, look what Floyd's doing. This is how he does it. It must be for a reason. He doesn't go 50 and 0 for nothing, you know? So they're all the good things. And then on fight week, obviously to see him up close and personal, you understand why he is one of the greatest of all time um, and, and he's a genius. I commentated as well at the O2 the other day. I was the commentator for his fight. So just to see him up close like that, it's, it's just amazing to watch. This is one thing that I kind of got when I saw him do that open workout the other day. And um, I don't know if you'll feel the same. I kind of got the aura that he comes across a little bit unbothered by everything outside of his immediate circle. So he'd be wrapping his hands there'll be cameras, there'll be lights, and it'll just kind of be him sitting there as if, almost as if he's on his own, in a sense. Yeah. He, he can't, I mean, I know he's had lights and cameras and all of this for, for 20 years, but it, I don't know, I got the idea that he's kind of unbothered and unfazed by absolutely everything other than perhaps the four or five people that, that are next to him. The funny thing is, though, I thought to myself the other day, I felt, I felt a bit sorry for him. Because, you know, when you're that famous, right, you don't really know who's around you for the right reasons. Obviously, you've got your immediate team that you've probably been with for years or your couple of your best friends that have been with you from childhood. But then outside of that, um, you know how big his entourage is. You don't really know who's there for the right reasons. And like you said, he looked like alone, even in the center. That, that's how it feels when I'm around him. It's like, I remember the other day after his fight, I had a little conversation with him after his fight, and I'll say, hey, what's up, Floyd? And he goes, hey, how you doing? But it's the way he spoke to me is like, I don't know, he looks like he wants to feel a bit normal where he's having a normal conversation with, a, with someone that's not his entourage. Do you know what I mean? But because he's got his entourage that's ushering him, you know, quickly onto the next thing, onto the next thing, he doesn't really have time to have that kind of moment. So it made me feel like, I wonder if he's actually... You know, re obviously he's happy with his life and what he's done, but like, you know, outside of that, I wonder if he wants something more than other than just that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I suppose, and it, it, it might sound ridiculous in the sense that he's made an obscene amount of money, will go down as one of, to some of the greatest boxer of all time. Yet you can be an enemy of your own success. I, kind of like that thing where people say, could you pop to the shops for a pint of milk sort of thing? What was the last normal thing that Floyd may have ever done, I guess? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, actually, I just went up to him and I, I whipped out my phone. I say, Floyd, look what I got done the other day. And I, and I showed him my tattoo. I've got uh, Floyd. It's still healing now, but it's, um, it's, oh it, it, it's still healing now. But I've got the money, Floyd money Mayweather on his knees of that Andre Berto fight when he's on his knees. So I done it where he's looking up at the pretty boy Floyd on my leg and then I put the 50 in there and everything like that and I showed him and he was like oh that's dope man that's dope so um yeah I, I just feel like he sometimes it looks like he wants a a, a different kind of friend yeah. outside of that circle he's in yeah. yeah I'll put a picture of that over the top for people to see that is cool um just one more thing perhaps uh kind of a bit of I guess an open-ended question so to end it on you're very young when it comes to the training game. You look at some of the most respected trainers around the country and you know they're pushing 40, some of them pushing 50. Um, but where does the story end for you, do you think, in boxing? Well, me and my business partner, we're born on the exact same day, May the 16th. Um, we just um, done a deal on our own gym. So the bigger picture for me is, uh, you know, my gym and the legacy it leaves behind, you know? Um, yeah, I want it to be a destination point where it's known all around the world 
and if you're not even from England, when you come to England and because you love boxing, you want to visit, you know, the gym. Um, trenches, boxing, the home of the daily effect. So I want to carry on, you know, that legacy, build fighters out of that gym, champions, um, yeah, and just leave a, behind a legacy for my family. And that's it, you know, um, I'm still learning. I never think I'm big enough not to learn. I'm always learning. Uh, one of my favorite coaches of all time is Emmanuel Stewart. So that's the kind of mindset and philosophy, um, you know, that I go with. So yeah, yeah, man, just keep working hard, staying focused. Um, even when people are trying to bring me down or take me off course, knowing what I want with my life and just, st just staying on it. Yeah. Daily top man. Appreciate you, mate. Thank you. I'm going to share something with you. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife and saying, completely different ball game. I'll walk away from it and this has been like a therapy session.